Azra too. Hope you guys are having a great day. Um, today we're going to be talking about how to graph radical functions. So functions that have roots in them. And mainly we're going to be talking about two different graphs. The square root graph and transformations of it. And then also the cube root graph and transformations of that. Okay, so number one. Let's graph the parent function square root of x. Hopefully you already know that from the beginning of the year and because we've used it a lot already. Um, but in case you forgot, this is what the square root function looks like. And then the cubic parent function, cubic cube root parent function, looks kind of like the square root, but it has two sides. It's kind of like one of these shapes. I can't really do it with my arms right now. <laughs> but anyways, it looks like the following. Okay, transformations. Same as they've always been. Okay, number one. So let's look at um, transformations of the square root function. So for this first one, we have a negative outside the root, which would have been like me putting a negative outside of the f. And then Therefore, there would be a negative outside the square root. And then that minus 4 would be like me having f of x minus 4 because I, I have the x minus 4 under the square root. Um, so putting those together, that would be negative f of x minus 4, negative square root of x minus 4. This negative outside is a vertical reflection. Um, and then the x minus 4 goes right to 4. So I'm going to sketch that graph in yellow. Sorry. <laughs> um, so it's a vertical reflection over the x-axis, so that becomes something like this, right? And then it's moved to the right 4. So, so then that point that was 0, 0 becomes 4, 0. Uh, the point that was 1, negative 1 becomes 5, negative 1, because it's just all moving over 4. So that's what g of x looks like. Next, we want to look at h of x. Okay, um, And this one, what's different is that that negative 4, the minus 4, is outside of the root, right? which means it was outside of the function, um, making it um, a translation down 4 instead of to the right 4. So again, vertical reflection is step one, so it's going to look something like this. And then it moves down four, so instead of um, zero, zero being the y-intercept, um, negative four is going to be the y-intercept, and then um, my function's going to, and then instead of the point one, negative one, we have the point one, negative five, and then the function looks something like that. So that's h of x. And last but not least is the square root of negative x, um, which would be like me taking the function f of x, right, which is the square root of x, but I need a negative wherever the x was. So it's going to be a negative on the inside of the x, and inside the function brackets, right? Um, and so that's going to be a horizontal reflection, a reflection over the y-axis, okay? So that's going to take my original function, which is the black uh, graph, and I'm just going to reflect it over the y-axis. So um, it's going to look something like that. Okay, so that's i of x. Okay, we can do the same thing for the cube root function. Um, so my original function is the cube root of x, which is... Um, what I have graphed on the right set of axes. Um, and then g of x is going to be a transformation of that. So a negative out front reflection over the x-axis. Um, and then x plus 3, the plus 3 on the inside, that means it's opposite of what you think, and therefore it's a horizontal change to the left 3. So let's sketch that. Um, we have the point 0, 0 is going to stay there. Um, but that point one one is going to be reflected down to one negative one, and the other one's going to go up to positive one. So your function after the trans uh, the reflection, whoops, that's not right, <laughs> is going to look something like that, and then we move it left three. So or I'm just going to take that function and move it to the left three. 
So there's a sketch of g of x. Um, h of x is a negative out front, the function again, which is also a vertical reflection over the x-axis. But that plus 3 is outside the radical, outside the root, which means instead of it being a horizontal change, it's going to be an up and down shift, and it's going to go up 3. So for h of x, we take that original function, f of x, the black line, the black graph, and then we reflect that over the um, x-axis, right? So we have something that looks approximately like this. And then we want to move it up three. So I'm just going to take that and move it up three spots. So the point that was zero, zero is now at zero, three, etc. And lastly, we have the function i of x, which is the cube root of negative x. Negatives on the inside, which means it's a horizontal change, a reflection, the negatives, the reflection um, over the y-axis. So if I take my original function, f of x, um, on the right, and I reflect it over the y-axis, that point 1, 1 becomes negative 1, 1. And then the point negative 1, negative 1 becomes 1, negative 1. Okay, and what ends up happening is this top part reflects um, to the left, okay, and then the bottom part reflects over to the right. And so that would be your i of x function, your reflection over the y-axis. And in this case, yes, it does in fact happen to be the same thing as a reflection over the x-axis. Not the same thing with uh, the square root, but um, with the cube root it is. All right, something that we have to talk about is the domain and range of these radical functions. Um, if it's an odd root, it's super easy because all of your odd roots are going to look something like this one, right? And all x values are covered. We don't have anything bad. Nothing bad is happening under the, under the root because you can have odd roots of negative numbers. So that's okay. Um, so your domain is all real numbers and then also, your range is going to be all real numbers because eventually, right, if I expand this graph out further and further and further, it's going to get higher, but very, very slowly. Um, it's not like an asymptote or anything. It's just going to keep growing, but just at a really slow rate. Um, so your domain and range of odd root functions um, are just all real numbers. Now, the tricky part is the even root problems. Um, I would recommend just graphing it. It's really, really easy to see what the domain and range are if you're, um, if you have the graph in front of you. So that's actually my first and foremost suggestion. Um, is just graph it and find the domain and range. Find where your x values exist and where your y values exist and then just do it that way. That's the easiest. Now algebraically it's a little more difficult, but if you are a person who prefers algebra, I'll show you that way as well. Um, domain, right, are all of your possible x values. And if you have a square root or a fourth root or a sixth root, right, an even root, you can't have negatives under the root, okay? So what I would recommend is just taking everything that's under the root and making it greater than or equal to zero and then just solving for what x has to be. Okay, for the range, I still kind of just recommend graphing it. It's a lot harder to figure out if you don't have the graph in front of you. Um, it's just all possible y values. Eh, it's kind of really hard without the graph. I'm just going to say graph it. Or at least sketch a graph of it, just so that it doesn't have to be a really fancy graph. Just You just have to know where it lies this way. All right, let's find the domain and range for the last couple examples that we did. I'm gonna, okay, so find the domain and range of the problems. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do the really easy ones first, which are all the uh, cube roots. So four, five, and six, those are all negative infinity to infinity for both domain and range, right? And that makes sense with the graphs that we had. Um, okay, let's just do that. Wow, that was so hard. Okay. So for the first three, which are a little bit more difficult, we have to graph them. Oh, but guess what? We already did. Ha! Huh, good. I'm so glad. Um, so for g of x, let's go back to our graph. 
which looked something like this, the yellow one, right? And if you just are looking for your domain, which are all your possible x values, you just look at the function and you say, hmm, okay, where do my x values exist? Uh, do they exist all the way at negative 6? Coming in, nope, 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 beep, 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 beep. Okay, so that's where your domain starts, is at 4. And then, again, we go from 4, and we go, do we have x values from 4 on? Do, 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 do. Yes, we do, right? We have function from 4 and on. Okay, so... Our domain for g of x is positive 4 to positive infinity. And the question is, is 4 included? Well, if you go to your actual function, if you plug in 4, right, for x, you have the square root of 0. Square root of 0 is okay. It's just 0, because 0 times itself equals 0. So that's cool. All right, range. Let's go back to the graph, see where the function is defined. And again, I'm going to take, you know, I'm going to start at negative infinity on my y-axis and go up and ask, do I have graph here? Do I have graph? Do I have graph? Do I have graph? Yes. Okay, this function, g of x, it's eventually going to go, it's going to go lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. It's really slow. Really, really, really slow. But eventually, it's going to go down to negative infinity, just very slowly. Okay, so our range so far is negative infinity all the way up to, I don't know yet, we haven't figured that out. Uh, hopefully it's pretty clear that you're going to stop at 0 um, when y equals 0. So, because um, you don't have a graph after that. So your range is negative infinity to 0. And yes, 0 is included. If you notice on the graph, it's not like an asymptote at 0 or a whole at zero, it's just equal to zero at zero. All right, next is h of x, negative square root of x minus four. If we go up to our h of x graph, which is the red one, we want to check our domain. Where is h of x defined? Well, is it defined at negative six? No. Is it defined at negative five? No, 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 no. Until all of a sudden we reach zero and we have a graph down here. Okay, so he the one who does that. Um, okay, so function is defined at zero and anything past that. So my domain is zero to positive infinity, zero included. Now range, on the other hand, we have to look starting at negative infinity. We can come up the y-axis and kind of say, oh, where does it equal, uh, where does the function start? Oh, the function starts, well, <laughs> you can't see it anymore because I've erased it. Um, but <laughs> the function is defined at 4, and it stops being defined at 4. So my range is from negative infinity to negative 4. Lastly is i of x which is the square root of negative x. And if we go back to our function, the green is i of x. And we just want to see, okay, where is my, where is my function defined on the x-axis and where is it defined on the y-axis? Um, and so you can see that we have function for the negative numbers, right? All on this side, everything to the left of 0 and including 0. Um, but nothing to the right of it, um, so no positive numbers. So my domain is negative infinity to zero, zero included. And then range, again, we start at the negative numbers. Do I have function? No, 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 no. When do I start? Right here. And then I have function on the y-axis all the way up to positive infinity. So domain, negative infinity to zero, range zero to positive infinity. And there you have your domain and range for that function. Now if you want to see the algebraic way for the domain, you just take the stuff that's under the root, which is the negative x, and negative x has to be greater than or equal to zero. So we just multiply both sides by negative one. When you multiply by negative, signs flip, 
And then we have x is less than or equal to zero, which is the same thing.